Thank you. On October 24th, 1998, a rocket launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida, carrying a small probe, the NASA mission Deep Space One. Deep Space One was part of NASA's new millennium program. They declared the era of big space missions was over. They were going to be better, faster, and cheaper from now on. So this was NASA trying to be agile. And it was. Deep Space One was an astonishingly small program compared to other space missions. It only weighed a few hundred kilograms. It was developed in just four years at a cost of $150 million. Compared to other NASA missions, this was uh, the tiniest mission they could have put on. It was their minimum viable product. And it was also a testing ground for a bunch of new technologies. Deep Space One had all sorts of cool new things that NASA was trying out. It had a futuristic ion pulse engine that looks like something out of Star Wars, and it had some new software that had just been developed at JPL called the Remote Agent. The Remote Agent was a fully autonomous control system for Deep Space One. The idea was instead of giving it very specific instructions on how to fire the rockets or something, they would just tell it, go take a picture of that comet, and it would figure out how to do it and do whatever it needed to do to accomplish that goal. So quite a long time before self-driving cars were a thing, NASA here is trying to build a self-driving spaceship. And the remote agent was written in what was then still a fairly obscure programming language called Lisp. And even in an academic kind of cutting edge place like NASA, this was quite a controversial decision. A lot of people did not like this. Uh, Ada was the programming language that NASA used. And <laughs> some uh, comments on that, and C++ was the hot new thing. So all the pressure was to move to C++, and they actually tried. They tried to port this piece of software, just a part of it, to C++, and after a year, they gave up. It was too hard to deal with C++ and to solve this problem at the same time. So languages definitely matter when you're trying to solve hard problems. Now, I'm sure I don't need to explain to this crowd, clearly, obviously, what they should have done is write it in Java. <laughs> Which could have happened a couple years earlier. Sun had just released their first definition of the Java language and its environment. And Java was pretty radical for the time. It had a bunch of ideas that were not mainstream, and they had to really fight to get those involved. Uh, as, as Guy Steele later said, they had to drag the C++ programmers halfway to Lisp. And there were some really big ideas here. Java was garbage collected. It had a bytecode interpreter. I mean, these were, these were really tough things to sell in, in the days when C++ was the mainstream thing. But there was another critical feature of Java that makes it especially interesting for us. And that was it had a dynamic runtime. The language itself, the Java language, was statically compiled. They couldn't be too radical. But the runtime was dynamic. It could load new code and link it into a running program uh, at runtime. And this is what makes closure possible. If it weren't for this one decision, none of us would be here today. So this is what gives us the lovely interactive development experience that we have with Clojure now, where we have an editor, a REPL, and our application all running at the same time, all on the screen with our highly technical uh, tiling window manager. And we can write some code and try it out in the REPL, and it doesn't work. Oh, right, because we forgot, oh, we have to load the code, then we can test it in the REPL, and everything works. Hey, look, there's a the rectangle on the screen. And then we can define some more code, we can see how that looks in the REPL, and test it out. Hey, it works, great. 
And then we might do some refactoring. So I think I want to change the definition of that function. I'll reload it, try it out in the REPL again. Everything still works. But of course, I'm a very conscientious closure programmer. I have unit tests. So I run all of my tests in the REPL and they all still work. So I commit my code and go home. <laughs> Come back to work the next morning, open up my editor, try to load my code, and darn, it broke. And that's kind of confusing, can't resolve rectangle, what is this weird error message, I don't know. So I, you know, I peer at the code for a while and say, where's rectangle? Oh, I see what I did. I made a dumb mistake. I changed the name of the function in one place and I forgot to change it in the other place. But my code worked before, the tests passed, what's, what's going on? How did I get into this situation? Well, when I first loaded the code, I evaluated these definitions and got two definitions in my running program, square and rectangle. Then I changed some of the code and evaluated again, and I got two more definitions in the running program. And because I've got the same name, square, that function just replaced the definition that was there before, but I didn't say anything about rectangle. I didn't tell Clojure that the rect function is the replacement for rectangle. And of course, Java's garbage collected, so it's not going to discard that rectangle function if I didn't tell it to. And the act of loading code, when I click that button in my editor, load this file, all that's really happening is I'm sending all of that code to the REPL. It's exactly as if I had typed all of those definitions back into the REPL and evaluated them one at a time. And there's nothing about that process that indicates that I've actually changed something. All Clojure can see is the new definition. So even in fairly trivial code like this, it's very easy to get into a situation where the definitions in the running program, the things in the language runtime, are not in sync with the things in my source files. They don't match up. And this is the trade-off we have to accept. Now, we love the interactive development experience. It's faster, it's easier, but it introduced this new possible way our program can fail. It added a new potential source of complexity. So of course, after you've used Clojure for a little while, you get, you get used to this kind of problem. You learn that, you know, periodically you gotta restart the REPL just to make sure everything still works. Run your tests in a separate process, blah, blah, blah. You know, you can deal with this. But you have to do something to make sure that periodically you get back to a clean slate in your program. But that's boring and tedious, so let's go back to space. On May 17th, 1999, about six months after the launch, the Deep Space One team was ready to test the remote agent. And so they turned it on with this command sent to the spacecraft. Now obviously that's not Lisp, but uh, you know, it was a very narrow channel. They had to save on bytes. So this was the command that they sent. At 11 a.m. on a Monday morning, they turned the remote agent on and lo and behold, it worked. They sent it some goals, it figured out, it had to fire some thrusters and do some things and, you know, figure out how to orient itself to take a picture and it fired the rocket and it did everything. It even handled a simulated failure scenario that they'd given it and everything was going great. They were so excited until midway on the second day when it stopped. Nothing. Silence. So what do you do? Well, at this point, Deep Space One was somewhere between 45 and 60 million miles away from the Earth. It took about 10 minutes just for a radio signal to reach it and come back. So you thought your REPL was slow to start up. These guys really had <laughs> a difficult problem, and they can't just walk over and reboot the thing. Uh, so what do you do? Well, fortunately, they had a secret weapon. The Deep Space One remote agent team had a REPL running on their spacecraft. It was an interesting experience, but they were able to use it 
to debug the problem, to actually diagnose the problem by poking at the runtime state of their spaceship to figure out what was wrong in it with it. Eventually, they found the bug. There was a race condition in another piece of software, not written in Lisp. <laughs> a race condition that, dis that appeared in production, moreover, despite months of rigorous testing, this is NASA we're talking about, and a formal proof of correctness. <laughs> but there was a bug, and they had a REPL so they could find the source of the problem, upload a patch, and fix it. They were able to finish the mission with Deep Space One and Remote Agent. So back to my own slightly more mundane problems. I was working on ways that I could have this interactive development experience, but also be able to recover the clean state of a program and avoid some of these things like renaming or deleting a function, avoid some of those bugs. So I worked on a library, first uh, in a testing library called LazyTest that never really went anywhere, and later on I revived the same ideas in a library called Tools Namespace. And I discovered, you know what, I can actually force a namespace to be cleared out. I can call remove ns to delete a namespace and all of the definitions, all the vars that it contains, and then reload it again. So this allows me to avoid some of those problems with old definitions hanging around. I discovered, though, in order to make this work, I had to kind of hack it a little bit because there's another piece of state down in the closure runtime that keeps track of which things have been loaded. And this is actually not even public. I had to reach into a private var in the closure runtime and mess around with it a bit to get all of this to work. So this is kind of a hack, but it does work. And this allows us to reload a namespace cleanly and as if we had loaded it for the first time. So I might be working on some code that does something, it has a computation and some side effects, and I try it out at the REPL, and I look at the result, and it's not quite right. So of course, this is closure, we like closure, we can test out individual pieces of our program, so I do that, it looks fine. So I think, okay, what else is going on? Maybe I'll add a little debugging helper. I'll write a little macro that prints out the value and returns it. I'll insert that into my function definition, call it again, and I can see, oh, obviously, I returned pi when I should have returned tau because everyone knows tau is better than pi. And so that's the result. And I, thank you, and I, I fix my function and, you know, I get it right, I reload it, I run it again, and everything works and it's great. Okay, good. So then I decide, you know what, I actually want to keep this little spy macro, so I don't want it to print something out at the REPL, I actually want it to log something using a logging framework. So I'll modify that macro, I'll reload it, and then I check my function again at the REPL, and it's still doing the old thing. That's odd. I know I reloaded the definition of spy. What's, what's going on? Well, to figure this out, I have to think for a minute. Okay, when I defined the function do stuff, when I loaded that function, it used the definition of the macro spy. And then the function was compiled and the macro ceased to exist. Once I loaded spy again, when I loaded the changed definition of that macro, I have a new definition of the macro, which is not the same one as the function was compiled with. So in order to get the behavior I want, in order to actually see the changed effect of changing a macro definition, I have to reload not just the definition of the macro, but also the definition of any code that uses the macro. And that's, you know, uh, this problem is not unique to closure. Any Lisp with macros has this problem. So this is a general problem, but it's something a little bit tricky to understand. You have to know how macro expansion works, and especially when macro expansion happens, in order to correctly update your code. 
So I try that and I see that it works, but I have this potential problem that the definition of a macro or some other piece of code that's used in the construction of my program might not be the same as the version that it was compiled with. And again, this happens because I'm changing things interactively. I'll give you an even more uh, tricky example, this one unique to Clojure, I think. Suppose I have a protocol, and I have a protocol, and in another file I have a record that implements that protocol, and then in my REPL I create an instance of the record and call the protocol method on it. So far, so good. Then I decide, you know what, I can do this a little better. I'm going to change something in that file where the protocol is defined and reload it. And then I call the protocol function and I get that. Now personally, I think some of the complaints about closure error messages are a bit overblown, but I have to admit that one made me blink for a bit. Can't, uh, no implementation of method draw, of protocol drawing for class rectangle. But I mean, it's, there is a definition for the method draw. It's right there, I can see it in the file. It's, you know, rectangle implements drawing and drawing has draw, and why doesn't it work? Well, this one's a little more complicated. When I load rectangle, that doesn't help either. When I first loaded this code, when I defined an instance of rectangle by calling its constructor, I'm actually creating an instance of a Java class. Records and protocols in the closure runtime both compile into Java classes. And Java classes are immutable. They can't be changed. The Java runtime does not allow me to change the definition of a class once it's been loaded. So when I reload some code, I actually create new classes that just happen to have the same name as the classes that were already there. So by evaluating this protocol definition again, I've created a new drawing class that looks just like the drawing class I had before. It would be very hard to tell them apart unless you looked at the actual IDs of the objects. These things would appear to be the same. They have exactly the same name. But the draw function is now been, has now been redefined to refer to this new Java class. So when I try to call the protocol method, I get an error because it doesn't know what it's linked to. It doesn't know how draw relates to rectangle. Even after I evaluate the definition of rectangle again, I still can't change an immutable class. I can't replace it. So my instance, R, now refers to a class that is not connected to anything else. And I get the same error again. The only way out of this trap is to actually construct a new instance of the record after I've reloaded both the protocol and the record. So that's pretty complicated. Um, and again, this happens because classes are immutable. So it turns out immutable things aren't always that easy to work with, especially when you want to change them. <laughs> There's a related version of this problem that happens when you pass functions as values to other functions. A function that's being called gets resolved as a var, so you can change its definition and you'll see the new definition of the var. But a function passed as a value is just a value, it's immutable. And so you might see that you have an old version of your function floating around in your program. So this is a very confusing situation where I have something named in my source code, but I have a named instance of that thing in the runtime and they're not actually the same. So this is very difficult. So I thought, okay, well what if I could actually figure out how to solve this for most situations? And in order to do that, I need to be able to reload not just the thing that changed, but anything that depends on it, anything that might have used it. And this is kind of tricky because 
Clojure doesn't really know anything about the order in which things are loaded. The NS macro is just a macro. It expands out to a bunch of imperative code that calls load and require and refer and makes a bunch of changes to these mutable pieces of the closure runtime. So there's not an easy way to just sort of say, okay, I changed this thing, therefore that thing over there also needs to be reloaded. But I could cheat a bit. So again, in lazy test originally, and then later in tools namespace, I decided, okay, let's pretend that NS is actually declarative. Let's pretend that it's just a piece of data. Fortunately, this is Lisp, so that's really easy to do. I can just read all of the source files and then look for a list starting with the symbol NS and then parse the contents out of that. And this is some of the code I wrote to do that. It's quite a bit more complicated than I would like, mostly because the NS macro is very uh, lax in how you use it. There are lots of different ways you can write the syntax, lots of different kinds of combinations of forms you can put inside it. So I had to write a lot of code to deal with all those different cases. I probably still don't have all of them, but I think most of the common cases are covered. I also have to make a bunch of assumptions in order to simplify the job of reloading code. The first is the biggest one. I have to assume that there's one file corresponding exactly to one namespace. Now there's nothing about closure the language that says this has to be true. A, a namespace can be split over several files. In fact, closure core is. But most of the time, most library and application code does follow this constraint, that there's one file for each namespace and only one, so I can make that assumption. Another assumption I make is that there are no circular dependencies between functions in different namespaces. Again, Clojure itself does not enforce this, but in order to build a set of relationships of namespaces, it's much easier if I can just say there are no cycles in that graph. So I'll make that assumption as well. Finally, I have to assume that the NS macro appearing at the top of every file is actually complete. I can't have any loading or requiring or other changes to the structure of the namespace happening outside of the NS macro. So things that might do conditional loading or loading different source files, none of that's going to work if I want to rely on the validity of the NS macro. I also have to assume that the NS macro is complete even though theoretically a function could be called by its fully qualified name even when it doesn't appear in the namespace declaration, that means there's a, another dependency from one namespace to another that the NS macro doesn't account for. So I have to say, okay, let's just, just avoid that. Everything that you use in a namespace has to be required in a namespace. So again, closure of the language does not enforce or require any of these constraints, but they are true maybe 90% of the time, and they make the problem much easier to model. So given those assumptions, tools namespace can look at all the source files in a directory or on the class path, read each one of them, find the NS declaration without evaluating it, just find the dependencies and build a graph of relationships, actually figure out how all the namespaces relate to each other. Once we have this graph, we can then look at the source files again and see which ones changed. So if one file got changed, say we deleted something, we changed a macro, oops, we changed a macro, we changed a definition, we made some edits to the file, we can call this function refresh, and it will reload the file corresponding to the code that changed and any other files, namespaces that depend on that file in the correct order. And this is not perfect, it can break in some cases, but it works pretty well. It will fix the problem of lost definitions, renamed functions, deleted names, syntax errors, and so forth. It helps us catch these kinds of errors faster without having to restart the process or run a separate process somewhere. So it works pretty well. It is designed to help bring the source code on disk or in the editor in sync 
with the definitions in the state of the language runtime so that the namespaces and vars in the runtime match what I'm looking at in the source files. And it does a reasonably good job of that. Uh, it's not perfect, in particular, since we added conditional read to closure. It's now broken that assumption that there's one file per namespace. So I'm still trying to deal with that. But it also doesn't help me with another problem, which is that the language can produce state out of the definitions that I've given it. So tools namespace doesn't know anything about the state of the application. So even now, I can get into a situation where I've written some code, and I've worked with it at the REPL, I've created some state in my running application, then I change that code to do something else, but I haven't changed the state in the application. I have old state. And in fact, it's possible, maybe a little tricky, but it's definitely possible to get yourself into a situation where the state of your program could not have been reached by the definitions that you currently have in your source. This is a pretty subtle problem, but it does happen. It's even worse if you have stateful resources, external resources in the operating system attached to the state in your program. Just for one example, if I have a web server running, it's bound to some socket, and then I reload that code. I actually recreate that state again, but it tries to bind to the same socket, and I get an error because it can't, because the old instance is already bound to it. But I can't actually fix it because the old instance was defined with the same name as the new instance, so I can't call it, and now I can't get an access to it, so I can't fix it. All I have to do is restart the REPL again. Sorry. So. In order to reload code safely, dealing with application state, I realized I needed a way to manage the application state at the same time. I needed a way to cleanly tear down all the state the application had created before I reloaded the code and then brought it all back up again. And that was the library called Component. So the way Component works, if you haven't seen it before, I said take each stateful resource, each thing that your program needs to manage, wrap it in a record. That record implements a protocol called lifecycle, and the lifecycle methods tell the program how to initialize that resource. Maybe acquire some external resource, like a socket, initialize some state, even starting a process running in another thread somewhere. Then there's a corresponding method stop that will shut the process down, release the resource, clear out the state, and so on. Basically do the opposite. So this is basically a pattern for managing all the stateful resources in my program, and I compose a bunch of these components together into a map called a system. And the system gives names to the instances of each component in the system. So now I have names to refer to all of these things, and the components can declare that they depend on other components by name. And that turned out to be really important. Having the dependencies declared by name rather than by type or by some kind of concrete reference gave a lot of flexibility. But once I have this collection of components and they've all declared the names of their dependencies, I can build the same kind of dependency graph. It's actually the same code that Tools Namespace uses for its dependency graph. Except now, I have a graph of the dependencies of the runtime initialization processes for each stateful part of my application. So I can call the component start function, on the system as a whole, and it will start all the components in the correct order and pass each of them their dependencies along the way. Then I can call stop, and it will stop all of the components in the opposite order. When I combine these two things together, tools, namespace, and component, I designed these to work together, and I made a template called reloaded uh, that has a bunch of helper functions in a dev namespace. This is a namespace that I only load at the REPL. I only use it for interactive development. And there I have a var where I can refer to the current system I'm working on. I have some helper functions to start and stop it. But the important part is this function reset. Reset gives me a single step 
thing that I can run at the REPL that will first stop the existing instance of the system, then reload any code that might have changed using tools namespace, which is now safe to do because I don't have any running state, and then create a new instance of the system using the new code and start it up again. Now you can still get into trouble with this. You can certainly get uh, errors in your component start functions that lead to losing access to your system and having the same socket binding kind of problem. But once you've developed them and sort of established the structure of your application, this works very well. It's very fast. You can quickly bring the whole system up, tear it down, start it up again without having to restart the REPL. So it's very useful for interactive development. And I always have a reference in the REPL to the system I'm working on. I can inspect it, I can call functions on it, I can do whatever I want. Now I discovered after releasing this that one of the challenges of explaining how this worked was the idea that the system itself is actually ephemeral. Outside of development, I really don't need it much. All I use it for is to start the system up. So in production, I might have a main or entry method that creates an instance of the system, uses it to start all the components in the correct order, and then lets go of it. The components themselves are actually running processes like a web server or an input loop or some kind of entry point to the system. And the reason I did all this was to get away from a pattern that had, I had encountered in my own code and in lots of other closure applications I worked with of defining functions that depended on state that was in global vars. And this is very convenient. It's very easy to work with at the REPL. So lots of tutorials and small examples will almost always be written this way. It's very straightforward. But the downside is the function definitions are now coupled to that particular var that holds the state or the resource that they depend on. So effectively, I've said by doing this, these functions, foo and bar, can only ever be used with that one global state resource. It's a singleton. They can never be used with any other resource. I've limited the amount of reuse I can get out of the code. Now, by contrast, the component has a little more ceremony to set up, but it allows me to define the functions in terms of the components they use. So they can take the component as an argument and then pull the state out of it. So this decouples the state of a resource or some stateful process from the functions that are actually going to use it. The downside, of course, is that I have a little more typing to do. I actually have to destructure these components. I have to pull things out of them. And if I want to get at them at the REPL, I have to pull them out of the system object. It's a little more work, a little more typing. From my point of view, it's totally worthwhile. So a common response I get when I demonstrate this is, well, why would I ever have more than one database? To which my answer is, why would you ever not? You know, I've, I've worked on a lot of large systems in Clojure, and I've seen applications grow and change over time. And in that experience, any time I think there's only ever going to be one of something, it's guaranteed that's going to come back to bite me. So there's always going to be new behavior, new requirements. There's very rarely just one of anything. So I often end up reusing different instances of the same component within a single application, maybe giving them different configuration or associating them in, with dependencies on other components. Because components themselves are instantiable, I can create many of them, I get an opportunity to reuse them. I can't do that with namespaces and vars. So another useful feature Given I said that these things are named, the names of the components are not tied to the component instances themselves. They are given in the system map. The scope of that system map determines the names of the components, which means they can have different names in different places. I can say this component needs or depends on something called database, and it's going to call it database in its functions and methods and whatever. But the actual global name for that thing is user DB. 
So potentially, I can get reuse out of the same component just by associating it with different dependencies in the system. It's a little bit complicated to think about, maybe a little bit of work to set up the first time, but it's very flexible. The final feature that I only discovered after I'd written this library and started using it for a while was just a convenient thing that fell out of the fact that I used records and maps for these things. So systems and components are both represented as records, and records in Clojure are maps. So anything I can do with a map, I can do with a component or a system. This ends up being really convenient for testing and development. All I have to do is associate or disos some you know, new components or some different components into my system and then start it up, and I have a modified version of that system that I might use for many different workflows as, I've, as I'm developing. It turns out I can even use this in systems that are distributed. So I have applications that consist of many small services, each of which is its own distinct system running in production on different machines. But in development, I might want to run them all in the same process. I don't want to start up six JVMs at once. So I can just merge them together. They're just maps. I can take two instances of systems, merge them together, and then start them all together and use them for development. This works as long as I'm careful about naming. I just use the same names for components that are shared across systems, and I just have to make sure I use unique names for the components that are different. This is very easy, and it works very well. Now, in theory, because components are maps, records are maps, systems are maps, you can nest one system inside another. And originally, I thought that might be a useful feature, so I allowed it. It turns out that leads to some very confusing results when you try to start and stop your system. So I've basically told people now, don't try to do that. You will get very confused about when and how things are getting started. So through all of this, I've been learning about how the closure runtime works, how uh, applications work, how to deal with state. I don't think I've solved it. I don't think this is the be all and end all of closure programming, but it's worked quite well for me and a lot of other people for a few years, so I'm pretty happy with it. But the main point, the thing that this made me realize is that the source code is not the same as the program. This is the, the realization about working that you get, working with an interactive development language like Clojure. Your program is not just the code that you see in your editor. It's actually something that is created. It's brought to life by evaluating the source code. And then it has a life of its own. Your program creates state of its own. It might do things that create things that you can't even see. So the reason the REPL is great is because we actually get access to this world. We can look at the running program. We can ask it questions. We can change things. We can poke at it. But we do have to remember that the thing we're interacting with in the REPL is not the same as the source code that we're typing in our editor. The things we interact with, in fact, might not be visible anywhere. We have to imagine them. So if you're interested in learning more about Deep Space One and how it used Lisp, there are some great resources by one of the engineers who worked on that program, Ron Garrett. He wrote an essay about it and uh, later did a talk, which you can find video of online. Uh, unfortunately, it's not quite a happy ending, although uh, the mission was successful. In fact, they even won an award for software development at NASA. Uh, that ended up being the last time that LISP was used on a NASA mission, although we did hear this morning that Boeing is using it, so maybe in the future we'll have uh, closure in space again. That would, be, that would be a lot of fun. So I highly recommend this talk. If you're interested, it's a great talk about uh, designing large systems and also working in a large organization. Until then, happy rappling, and watch out for some of those perils. Thank you. <laughs>